Beautiful people. Thank you. <laughs> Such a joy for us to be here with you. Um, Trevor, my brother, <laughs> I often brag about you. You know, it's so wonderful that we can discover one another in Christ. For so many years, our ideas of ourselves and our ideas of other people have been filtered through the wrong measure. It's like trying to measure temperature with a ruler. Amen. You always come up with the wrong answer. <laughs> but when we discover one another in the context of our original design, our original value, we can afford then to say and think the nicest things about one another without the fear of exaggerating. So when we discover ourselves revealed, not by nice positive thoughts, you know, where we see something that we would life, like to be or become one day, but when we discover the truth about ourselves, the truth as it is, not in your experience or my experience or somebody else's experience, the truth as it is in Christ. You see, when God visited planet Earth 2012 years ago, Jesus did not arrive with an overnight bag to just have a brief visit and a check on how things happening on planet Earth and off he goes again. He came to forever divide human history into a before Christ and an after Christ. The greatest moment in the history of planet Earth is now celebrated in the fact that human beings, ordinary people, can discover themselves in a far greater reality than any other thing that we have known in our brief history on planet earth. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul writes these words. He says, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now the moment when we, real, when we read the word gift, we are almost like a bit embarrassed because, you know, the moment you think gift, you think, well, is it Christmas? Is it my birthday? What, what did I do? What do I do to deserve this gift? Because birthdays, you know, we kind of feel comfortable with gifts. Christmas times, we sometimes feel, well, it's Christmas, I deserve something. You know? But here God interrupts human history at the point where we were at the lowest low. I mean, when you read the scriptures, you'll find out that between Malachi, if you study about the, about the history of the Old Testament and the history of the New Testament, there were 400 years of silence between Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, and Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. Which means for 400 years there wasn't a prophet, there wasn't anyone in 400 years of generations that could say, I represent the voice and the thought of God. There was just silence. And yet God arrives on planet Earth, not to quickly sort a few things out and then, you know, well, you know, sorry, it's beyond hope. We'll just my right planet Earth off. We'll drink it, Roy Knoppy. We'll, you know, um, get rid of this planet. We'll start something somewhere else again. God came with absolute intent. And God's intent was not to pay planet earth a little Christian visit so that he could kickstart the Christian religion. God's intent was to reveal and to redeem the original blueprint. The word blueprint means the original image, the original likeness that God had in mind when he said in Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So Jesus did not come to win a few desperate votes for a new club called the Christian Club. He didn't come and raise banners and say, don't vote for Muhammad and Buddha and Moses, vote for Jesus. He came and he just displayed the image and the likeness of God in human form. In Colossians 1 and verse 15, Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. 
Now what does that mean? If we just say that again, if Jesus is the image of the invisible God, can God continue to be invisible? No. Even though we have forgotten what manner of people we are, because we've adopted a distorted image of ourselves here in our minds. In our minds we began to believe lies about ourselves. And so when Jesus arrives on planet earth, He just comes and displays the truth. So that we may know the truth as it is in Christ. And realize that what we see in Him is not a potential me, but is the true me. Because he says, you will know the truth. And in your knowing the truth, you will know true freedom. How do we measure freedom then? Freedom to live the life of my design. The very life that God had in mind when he breathed me into existence. You see, in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Now isn't that a most amazing thought? That means that God says, you might have been a surprise to your parents. I mean, your mother found out one day, oops, I'm pregnant. But God says, hey, no surprise to me. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. That means it's not my brief history on planet earth that introduces me to God. He has always known you. You see, when we discover Jesus Christ in the revelation of the gospel, now the word gospel really is the Good news. Now when is good news? Good news. Actually, it's a Kaiser. We've got a Kaiser Chiefs man here. Stand, stand up, my brother. Proudly wearing yes. Kaiser Chiefs. Okay. Now, in this group here, are we all Kaiser Chiefs supporters? So we've got problems here. We've got big problems in the context of soccer. We are a divided group. Yeah. Let's sit down, my dear brother. Don't be embarrassed about your jersey. I see there's a Western province man here. You know, I grew up in Newlands. And then I studied in Pretoria University. And I found out very quickly in Pretoria, especially in Loftus, you don't open your mouth too loud about Western province. But on Lupi Narkis, I mean, they throw anything that can travel at you. So... In the context of our identifying ourselves according to our uh, popular team or our men that out there, you know, they perform on our behalf, we have a lot of things that could possibly divide us. But when it comes, if we're talking soccer now, when it comes to Bafana Bafana, we suddenly um, find out, you know what, I can even tolerate these guys and I can tolerate whoever, whatever, because now we've got something that carries a higher definition of the sport. So we kind of drop our individual identities. You know, we don't rock up with a vuvuzela that is painted in a Kaiser Chief colors at Bafana Bafana's game. No, no, no. We want to be united. And the reason we feel united is because we feel that we are represented on a higher level. We're not talking just club level now. We're talking national level. And when it comes to national level, man, we feel Bafana Bafana. We even look friendly. We can sit next to a Kaiser's man and a Pirates man. We can, and we, there we are. We feel we are in the same team. Because we have a higher representation. Now you remember in 2010 what happened when we were finally out. When Ghana started performing. We felt well at least we're still touching the same soil. The same continent. So let's put our hopes behind Ghana. And we got so mad at that handball. Remember I mean we were furious. Because we felt represented. And we felt equally cheated. We felt come on man that's an African. We've got to be associated. When Jesus Christ came to planet earth, he did not come to start a new club. 
a new group, a new association. He came to reveal something. And uh, when Mary was pregnant with him, they had to go to Bethlehem because it was time for the statistics to be sorted out. But uh, there was no room for them in Bethlehem. No place in the hotel. I mean, imagine. Not some great political leader arriving in town. This is the God of creation. The engineer of the universe. The father of lights. God himself. The very creator. You see, (laughs) our faith does not invent God. What we believe about God is not what matters. You know what matters? What God believes about us. And here God, the originator of life, the one who imagined you before he formed you in your mother's womb, the one who has no other agenda for your life, but to give you, according to the measure of the gift of Christ, life more abundantly, bigger than your dreams. So here God arrives on planet earth, not to condemn and to judge the world, but to free the world with the knowledge of the truth. You see, we live in a wonderful technological day where we can send text messages to one another. And we realize that even though we are sitting five rows apart, or we are 5,000 kilometers or 10,000 kilometers apart, we can trust technology to take my little brief text message and zip it across in a few seconds. Zip! Immediately somebody else can respond to it because it's Technology, we trust technology. Now, if technology can be that brilliant or that frustrating, (laughs) why do we communicate through technology? Because we can speak with one device to another because there's a compatibility. Even though they wear different brand names, the one can be Samsung, the other one can be another song, but the stuff can talk because they are compatible. (laughs) So here the author of life, the God who imagined you, he speaks a language, but it's not one of the 11 official South African languages. It's not even Greek or Hebrew. It's a language that all of mankind globally can understand. It's like the language of rain. Have you noticed when the rain comes, it speaks a language that the seed can understand. Whether the the rain falls in the Zimbabwean side, or in the South African side, or the Namibian, or Botswana, or Mozambican side, that rain speaks a language that awakens the seed. The seed encounters something in that rain that awakens life in itself. Now in Isaiah 55, Um, God gives us such a beautiful picture. Um, In verse 6 we read in Isaiah 55 where the prophet says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now I remember reading that scripture as a young boy and I thought, Is God playing hide and seek with us? You know, it's like, now I'm seeking God and oh no he's hiding again. And then I found another scripture which really blessed me. It's in Isaiah 65, verse 1. And in Isaiah 65, verse 1, God says, I was ready to be found by you before you sought me. I said, here I am. And if you didn't get it the first time, he repeats it. He says, here I am. I was preaching somewhere in Florida last year in America and a lady came to me afterwards. She was laughing. She said, you know, I have a three-year-old boy at home and he loves playing hide and seek with me. She says, then I go and stand in the corner and I start counting till 10 and he goes and hides himself. She says, but by the time I get to 10, he jumps out of the cupboard. He says, here I am, here I am. (laughs) 
I said, that's just like God. God is not playing hide and seek with us so that we have to spend a lifetime trying and struggling to find God and nearer my God to thee. And I've prayed and I've fasted and I've given my money and I've made commitments and re 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 dedications and I got reborn 30 times now already and I'm still trying to get closer to God. I remember visiting the maximum prison in Worcester a few years ago. It was my first visit there. And a man came to see me afterwards and he was crying. And um, I mean, this man was tattooed. Eh? Every little bit that was visible under the orange overall was tattooed. But he was crying. He said to me, Sir, I've been here for 13 years. And for 13 years I've tried to be a Christian. He said, Today for the first time I heard good news. Good news. Do you know what is the good about the good news? You see, if, um, if I'm a pirate's man and I hear Kaiser Chiefs took the cup, hey, hey, Baba Wetun Kosi Army. I'm crying, man, because my team failed me. But for the, the Kaiser guys, hey, big time, they are Jabula, they are, you cannot get them happier. What makes it good news for the Kaiser guys? Because they won, even if they didn't play the game. Even if they were not at the stadium, maybe they were away traveling somewhere in a remote area and they only heard the news of the victory two weeks later. They still feel included. Do you know that the best news means absolutely nothing if you feel excluded? But what makes the good news good news? The fact that in the mind of God, I'm not talking in the mind of this religion or that philosophy or this denomination. In the mind of your maker, Jesus Christ represents you. You are fully represented in him. When God revealed Jesus, God said something to the human race. He says, I have made up my mind about you. Remember he said to Jeremiah in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. And then there in, I think it's chapter 29, God says to Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you. There are thoughts to favor you, to give you a future. God sees his future for your life life more abundantly life exceedingly abundantly above all I mean it's like Paul's running out of superlatives hy kan het die groot genoeg sê nie dis amper soos ons tkosa woord en ons zoele woord vir God onkel onkel the big big so Paul says listen guys your dreams that you dream for yourself they're too small room to claim. God has made up his mind about the human race in Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's mind made up about you. You see, Jesus didn't sneak in onto our planet because he felt a little bit embarrassed, you know. He actually just have a small little message that he's going to say to a little few people and then quickly let's huddle them together and off we go and we start it somewhere else and leave the planet to perish. No, no. In Psalm 24 and verse 1, David announces that the earth is the Lord's. How much of it? And the fullness thereof. The fullness? I mean, God, what do you mean? He says the world and those who dwell in it. Do you know that planet Earth is God's property? I mean, in no legal system does a thief ever become an owner. And yet in our Christian theology, we have been very quick to hand over 
stuff to the thief, the devil's children. You know that the devil doesn't have one legitimate child? He is the father of lies. Lies. But when the true father arrives on planet earth, camouflaged in human form, God reveals that human form is his most favorite expression. God has fully expressed himself in visible form, not in some angelic being, but in a person formed in a mother's womb. You see, God's passport to planet earth was his human body. Otherwise, what he said to us would not be that good news. Because we would not be that fully represented. I mean, if Jesus just came briefly in some kind of angelic form, it would have been great. Well, a wonderful philosophy. Let's try and follow the Christian philosophy. No, no. He came and expressed the original idea. You are the greatest idea that God had ever had. When God wrote to your DNA in your mother's womb, God had a being in mind whose friendship would intrigue him, would bless him for all eternity. God doesn't see a cell by date when it comes to friendship. Lydia and I are together now for 39 years. We have just celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary two weeks ago. And we thought, well, it's the first 33. Let's get at least another 34. Let's get at least another, at least another 40 going. Because she now love has within it a desire to extend beyond boundaries, beyond time. And here God, who is love, God doesn't have a little compartment that you've got to switch on that says love, but be careful with the other side. Many forget it, the God is love. God has no other agenda. And when he arrives on planet earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, Jesus says this. He says, no one knows the Father. Can you imagine how shocked the Jews were? I mean, they thought they had copyright on God. He says to the Jews, you know, all your studies, all your history distracted you rather than brought you to a place of revealing who God is. You formed your ideas about God, but I tell you what Jesus says, the Son reveals Him. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What does Colossians 1.15 say again? Jesus is the what? The image of the who? The invisible God. Which means God can never again go invisible on man. Because in the person of Jesus Christ, God declares exactly what he had in mind in Genesis 1.26. His image and his likeness revealed in human form. Do you know that Jesus did not come to this planet as an example for us? Wow. But as an example of us. Had Jesus come to planet earth just to be another example, so that we have to follow hard and try and become more and more like Jesus, I mean, Jesus will have huge competition. Because that's what Buddha and Moses and, and Muhammad and all these other guys are. Just follow my teachings. You know, read my book and study my book. And you know what we've done with the Bible? We've done window shopping with it. What is the difference between a display window and the mirror? Ah, a mirror you see yourself. But in the display window, you see something that you'd like to have, but you can't afford it. So I do my window shopping. So I think, no, the price is too high, man. I like those shoes. I can imagine those shoes on my feet. But when you look in a mirror, a mirror cannot lie. Jesus did not come as a display window of a potential you. The truth as it is in Jesus. The truth about what? The truth about you. 
because we're talking at this school, middle school, language. Middle school, language. Where I discover how God thinks about me. God is not coming to tease us, almost to terg, to mock us with some kind of impossible standard that I must now spend the rest of my days in the flesh to try and achieve to gain that level of holiness. I mean, here's my wife. When we were young, we were so proud that her cousin, Reinhard Schiel, was at that time the record holder in all of Africa for high jump. For 21 years. That doesn't mean for 21 years he could jump that high. But in the course of his career, 21 years ago then, he managed to reach a height officially here in Stellenbosch. And it crowned him as the top athlete in the discipline of high jump. For 21 years, not one of the other athletes, never mind the guys with the boopies. I mean, the fit guys, they couldn't get that high. And me, I was married to his cousin. But you think I could jump any higher because I knew Reinhard Schiel? Now, you know what we do? We get so Christian sometimes that we deceive ourselves. We just wear the label, you know, the jersey and the flag. Because we kind of get this idea that I'm represented there, so it's okay. <laughs> Jesus did not come as an example for you, but of you. You see, for so long we can hide in Newlands, and we can wear the stripes and the stormers and the flags, and we feel so proud to be associated in those guys who are so brilliant and sometimes not so brilliant. But there they are representing us. We feel, man, we are brothers. But actually... We are just falling for the old psychological game of imagination. So when our team scores, they're from Hermanus where we come from, old Aplo, you know, Gil Aplo, he can, he can really do it for us, man. And then we feel so great. But when the national coach fails to select him, man, we say things about the national coach, which we are fearful to repeat from the pulpit. Because we feel disappointed, you know what I mean? God is not playing psychological games with us. God is not coming onto the scene to give us just a little Jesus banner that we could now strive towards and hopefully we'll make the great as the heroes at the dag van nie that at least we'll be more or less associated because we've got the Christian label. No, no. Jesus had a much larger agenda. His plan was not to impress us with the unique, impossible life that we can live. His plan was to reveal the truth about us, so that now with unveiled faces, we may behold the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. What happens when you look into a mirror? You see your Self. But hey, I thought Paul said we are beholding at the what? The glory of the Lord. Will that perhaps mean that you and I are His glory? You are God's masterpiece. When He knitted you together in your mother's womb, His thoughts found expression, found a language in your life. I'm always so impressed with Jesus' friends when I read through the Gospels. And I kind of <laughs> laugh that, you know, the religious guys missed it. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, I mean, they missed it. His best friends were the worst sinners in society. The prostitutes. The tax collectors, everybody knew these guys. They couldn't hide, man. I mean, everybody knew where the tax collector lived. And the Pharisees would make sure they walk wide paths around that house. Why? To show we are distance from this unholy man. He steals everybody's money. Jesus goes and has a party with him. <laughs> he they are offended. They said, oh, your cousin John, his disciples, you know, and us Pharisees, we fast. And you guys go into a party? What's wrong with you? 
Because Jesus says, I did not come to condemn this world. I came to reveal the truth. And God is so confident about the truth. God is so certain about the truth. God is not in make-believe mode, faking it until I make it. No, no. God is absolutely persuaded about the integrity of your design. Because when God thought you, He saw His own brilliance, the spectacle of His own likeness wrapped up in your skin. An ordinary person on planet Earth unveiling the glory of God. The word glory just means opinion. The opinion of God. God's idea. God's thought in you. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to take the veil away so that we could look at Him and discover in Him the mirror that reveals the truth about me. And so here all these like top level sinners of society felt drawn to Jesus. Jesus was like a magnet. They could not resist Him. They felt drawn to Him. Why? Was it because Jesus made the law, you know, the law of Moses, a little bit more comfortable? So nobody can jump that high, guys. I mean, Moses struggled a few times. And I mean, maybe Rani Shield got it right to jump that high. But for the rest of us, what we'll do from now on, um, we'll just lower the standard a little bit. So that even us fat guys, you know, we can do a little jump and a hop and a skip and we think, yeah, I'm the hero. I'm a co, you know, um, conqueror with Reinhard Schill. I can jump. No, no, no. That is called deception. Jesus did not come to introduce a new set of rules. Okay, guys, from now on, you don't need to get 10 out of 10. I mean, that's virtually impossible. So 5 out of 10 is cool. Or, you know, try and sin a little bit less. Or if you sin, don't get caught. You know what I mean? No, no, no. Jesus didn't come to cheat us. He came to free us by revealing the truth. What was it then that the prostitutes and the drug dealers <laughs> and the money changers saw in Him? They saw the truth about themselves. They realized, hey, I lived a lie. I'm not going to waste one more day living a lie because the truth has come so that I can have life more abundantly the largest possible life that can be lived is the life that God knitted together in your mother's womb and breathed into you there is no one on planet earth in its history or in its future that can match you you have no competition. I mean, in some context, you know, we were afraid of our fingerprints. Because, hey, these things are on record now, man. But you know what? No one can match your fingerprint. Because nobody can match your design. Your DNA was written by God. And it gives you your uniqueness. God does not just tolerate you. He loves you dearly. You know why? Because you're so priceless to Him. You're absolutely, irreplaceably priceless to your Maker. God did not bargain down a deal with the devil to redeem you. You don't even talk business with a thief. Why? Because a thief never becomes owner. So if the earth is the Lord's to begin with, and we're talking the fullness thereof, we're talking the world and those who dwell in it, we're talking that planet earth is the property of God. And here God comes into our history, not just to give us a nice convenient Christian calendar so that we can book our appointments for next week and our dreams for the following year, but that God could come and make a permanent declaration. The time has been embraced in eternity. Eternity embraces time. So that God's eternal, not I used to be, or I'm going to be, but I am, can find presence in you. 
in my breath, in my thoughts, in my being, God communicates His dream. Remember, Jesus didn't come to win a few votes. No, no. He came to free the original life of my design. So that I can look into this mirror. Do you know the story about the ugly duckling? Hey? I mean, what did the ugly duckling see reflected in the water? Was it a potential swan? Or was it a real swan? Now we need to hear this, because you know, sometimes we get confused. I mean, I've seen Christian um, pictures on Facebook, you know, where they put this little kitten, a little ginger kitten, in front of a mirror. And in the mirror, there's this lion. And they say, this is what Paul meant. No, it's not. That's deception. That's what religion wants to teach us. That, listen, you're just a little cat, but you know, if you try it long enough and you practice your roar, you might just be able to get your mouth from mouth to mouth. And you could, you know, you need a few facelifts. It's going to take time. And maybe a whole lifetime, maybe a few lifetimes. But eventually, you know, you'll come out like a lion. No! That is not what Jesus revealed. He did not reveal a new step and a new recipe and a new uh, set of rules where if I strive harder, I might just become more and more like Jesus. That's what religion teaches. That's where John the Baptist's mind got, oh no, he must become more, I must become less. It sounds so wonderful, but John the Baptist lost the plot. He should have been the first disciple of Jesus. But he loved his own pulpit. I mean, he was so bold to announce, behold the Lamb of God. This time it's not man's Lamb. This time it's not man trying to get closer to God with another sacrifice. To just my, try again, buy time, you know, for next year's sins. So I'm paying now sin later. No, no, this time God presents mankind with His Lamb. The Lamb of God. And what does John say by the Spirit of God? He takes away the sin of the who? The nice guys. The world. So when God makes this calculation, God says, In my Lamb... I remove your transgressions from you as far as the east is from the west. Of your sins and your iniquities and your unrighteousness, I will think no more. Sometimes we, we get the idea like in Luke 15, the other brother, you know, he sits there, he just keeps notes. And he, he's the big man. He's sitting there, he, he's this brother. He messed up our reputation. He destroyed our family name. He wasted our money. And he's like disappointed that the father just loves him. Because in our own minds, we have allowed a lie to reduce us to these horror creatures. And then Jesus comes and He reveals that our original value is still in place. Remember the woman had ten coins and she lost one. But you think, ah, oh, it's alright, you know, I've still got nine. No, no. Go and read Luke 15. She lit the lamp in the house. It's always good to look for something where you've lost it. Sometimes we are very sincerely seeking, but we're seeking in the wrong place. What did we say? Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. God cannot be found any nearer than what He is. In the person of Jesus Christ. Not as in a display window. As in a mirror. So that we suddenly realize. Hey, when I look into this mirror. I'm actually seeing myself. The way that God has always known me. You see God is not distracted by my sin. I am distracted by my sin. So God says I've always known you. And I've come to reveal you. So that you may know the truth about you. Not the God who's sitting there with a frown on the forehead, counting my sins, keeping lists and lists and records of my sins. The God who says, my son, I've come to embrace you again. Because the last coin never lost its original value. When they challenged Jesus about the issue of taxes, 
He says, bring me a coin. And they hand him a coin. He holds it up. He says, whose image? Whose inscription are we talking about? Everybody knew the answer. Oh, it's Caesar. You know what Jesus says? One of the most powerful statements in the whole Bible. He says, well, return to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But here's the punchline of the gospel. Return to God what belongs to God. Whose image and inscription do you bear? Where did Caesar get his image from? No, no, no. He didn't get that hook nose from his father. Because there is only one true father. Not the father of the flesh. You see, man, that if, if, if God knew us before he formed us in our mother's womb, where did we begin if we didn't begin in our mother's womb? Man began in God. You know the very first word in the Bible, in the Hebrew language, is the Hebrew word berosh. You know what it means? We wrote there in the beginning. You know what berosh means? In the head. You see, I was, we were in Cape Town on our way here today because I, I failed to introduce all our friendship, but we, are, we have friends from about 12 different countries visiting us over the last five days in Hermanus. I'm not sure whether all of them are still represented yet, but we have friends from all over the world. So we travel through Cape Town and I noticed quite a few new buildings going up in the middle of like waterfront area in Cape Town, central. Massive works going on. Do you think that those buildings, which is somebody's idea, somebody woke up one day and said, I'm going to look at a building, he didn't plan on my cop. He said, no, 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 no. What we see in there, in that structure, took a lot of thought. Someone had to see that building before you and I saw it. Someone saw that building, not just so much more or less an idea. When it comes to municipalities, especially Cape Town municipality and cities like that of prominence, and Cape Town has a reputation of the number one destination in the tourism industry. So they have to be very precise, very accurate when it comes to the foundations, when it comes to the exact measurements. I mean, you have to be so absolutely precise. Now think, do you think for one moment that you are just the result of some clumsy thoughts? You are God's poetry. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul says, You are God's workmanship. And he uses the Greek word poema. Do you recognize that sound? Poema. That's where the English poem comes from. You are God's poetry. You're not just some clumsy expression of God. You give face to the image and the likeness of God. So when Jesus came to planet earth, he didn't come to play a few Christian games and some religious talk. He came to exhibit the image of the invisible God as in a mirror. There's the punchline. You see, to believe in Jesus means absolutely zero. Even the devil believes in Jesus. We're not talking historic evidence. We're talking revelation knowledge. When the veil is removed, Paul says the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations is now discovered again. Which is what? Christ in you. Hmm. Farmers can spend their life and their lifetimes from generation to generation plowing a field, harvesting its crop, barreling the wine or making its bread. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hidden in an agricultural field. There is so much more value to that field than what we thought. Jesus came to unveil the true you as in a mirror. And in this mirror school, we are not here to hand out certificates because you are God's certificate. Not written with some fancy handwriting, 
but written by the Spirit of God who engages with your spirit and speaks a language in your heart where you discover the truth about me so that I can be free. And free in indeed. Free beyond tomorrow's temptations. Free beyond ten years heaped up temptations. Because suddenly temptation has lost its voice. Because a stronger voice has come to define me in Christ. Not in my idea of Christianity. Not in my idea of popular thought patterns and philosophies. But God's idea of me displayed. So when I now read the book, I mean this beautiful Bible is perhaps the most dangerous, it is the most dangerous book on planet earth. Because the Bible has confused and divided more people than any other book. This book has caused wars. Because there is only one key that unlocks its mystery. Not this one's idea or that one's idea, what we believe and majority vote wins. No, no, no. The key, the original thought that proceeds from the mouth of God is called the incarnation. Do you know what that word means? The word made flesh. And that's what we're going to study and share in the next few days. Not so that you can try and get it all sorted out in your head. No, no, no. We're not talking head knowledge in the first place. We're talking heart to heart. Because it's from your innermost being. It is the spirit of your mind that we are addressing. It is the deepest seat of consciousness. With something in me, like those two men on their way to Emmaus. Remember the report? They said, did not our hearts ignite within us? While he was just speaking scriptures to us, he took us through Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And what happens when my heart ignites? I hear very good news. Very good news. Why? Because I suddenly realize the days of window shopping are over. I don't need to claim another promise in the book because the promise claims me. When I look in the mirror, the promise is to the ugly duckling, Hey, Mr. Swan, wake up. You want to waste another day, another lifetime in the wrong mind when you can be swan. For now, forever. Because this is what Jesus came to do. He came to destroy every lie that we believed about ourselves so that we can know the truth. The truth of sonship. He says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit. Not with neatly packaged doctrines, no. With a cry that says, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. This gospel declares our true sonship. It puts the father of lies out of business. <laughs> oh, thank you, Father. That's when the fa why the Father looks at you with absolute certainty, with absolute persuasion. God's not biting his fingernails worried about your future, man. Because God has made a move. And his move is Jesus. And Jesus is God's mind made up about you. Jesus is what God believes about you. We thank you, Father. That's why Paul says, in Romans 1, that the power of the gospel, what gives the gospel its power, is a revelation. Not of what we did wrong, but what God did right. The righteousness of God. And then Paul says, from faith to faith. That means faith has a source. 
He is the author and the finisher of faith. I'm not trying to make believe my salvation. I discover how saved I am because God says so. I discover how healed I am because God says so. So God reveals his thought. He unveils his idea of you in Jesus. We honor you, Father. We salute you this evening with our amen. We agree with you about us. I agree with you about me. I want you to whisper that in your own heart. I agree with God about me. I agree with God about me. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for the gospel, for good news indeed. We honor you, Lord.